Good afternoon and welcome to our YouTube channel this afternoon. Uh, Pastor Richard introduced our new series for the 4 o'clock time, which is uh, going through the miracles in John's Gospel. And so this is my first one in that series, and I too welcome you. Uh, Pastor Richard look, looked at the miracle of Jesus turning water into wine last week. So today we're looking at uh, Jesus heals an official son in John chapter 4, beginning at verse 43, and I'll read that now for you. That says, After two days he left for Galilee, and in brackets, Now Jesus himself had pointed out that a prophet has no honour in his own country. Now, outside of the brackets, uh, When he arrived in Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. They had seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, for they also had been there. Once more he visited Cana in Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine. And there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. When this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son, who was close to death. Unless you people see signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. The royal official said, Sir, come down before my child dies. Go, Jesus replied, your son will live. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. While he was still on the way, his servants, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. When he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him, Yesterday, at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. Then the father realised that this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, Your son will live. So he and his whole household believed. This was the second sign Jesus performed after coming from Judea to Galilee. So the first sign was uh, Jesus turning the water into wine. And now the second sign is the healing of this man's son. Uh, and it's interesting that uh, they should call them signs. These are obviously um, very important, significant points in Jesus' ministry. His first miracle at a wedding and uh, his first healing of someone, and they're described as signs. So we'll look at those in close detail as we go through the text. Um, it is worth pointing out um, John's use of geography in this uh, text that he really goes out of the way to give us the geog uh, the geographical descriptions of the places. So uh, Jesus from Galilee, born in Nazareth, and uh, he sort of ministers in that region. And previous to that, he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival. Many people saw him do many things. And now he's worked his way up to Cana. And just to give you a map, uh, a rough drawing, there is the Sea of Galilee. Uh, we have Cana here. Jerusalem is all the way at the bottom, so that's quite a, a big distance for Jesus to cover. But then we read about this uh, royal official came all the way from Capernaum, and that is at the top of uh, the Sea of Galilee, and he came all the way down to Canaan. And of course, no cars at that time, um, 18 miles on horses and just traveling, so uh, quite a long journey, specifically to get to Christ, uh, to beg him to heal his son. Um, now, it's just worth maybe thinking about who was this man who encountered Jesus. Uh, the text tells us that um, there was a certain royal official. Uh, a lot of people have wondered if this was a Roman uh, official who had a high authority. Uh, but other commentators have suggested that this was a, a Jewish a uh, royal official in the king line of Herod. So um, this is Jesus speaking to a Jewish person. There's an interesting sociological factor here of a man with high authority comes to Jesus. And uh, when we think of Jesus' ministry, we often uh, recall when Jesus uh, socialized with uh, sinners and tax collectors and prostitutes very much people with the low social status at that time. But um, he also 
uh, spoke to people of all ranks and all different um, social statuses. So, you know, Christ never excluded anyone uh, into coming into the kingdom. He accepted all. So we have this interesting uh, dynamic now of this Roman official coming to Christ. Well, uh, the story is quite straightforward, really. This man came to Jesus absolutely begging him to heal his son who was close to death, maybe some sort of fever that was taking its toll. And um, you can just hear the plea and the cry, can't you, in this man's voice to just please heal my son. And obviously news had spread very quickly about Christ in those regions. And um, in fact, Jesus did go and preach in the synagogues in in Capernaum uh, a little bit later. So news was spreading quick, hence the reason this man travelled down to come to him. And uh, Jesus gives a very interesting uh, comment back. It says in verse 48, Unless you people see signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. Now, uh, Jesus had said at the the beginning that um, he had pointed out that a prophet was without honour in their home country. We read that in other parts of the Synoptic Gospels. Uh, But there was also a sense that uh, some people did respond to Jesus uh, in his home area. But there is this uh, sort of sense that uh, people will not believe unless they see some sort of physical sign or almost see the evidence directly in front of them. Now that speaks very powerfully into the mindset of how people are in the world today. But I'll return to that. I just want to stick with the uh, the biblical narrative for now and then apply that to our situation. Whenever we read about um, Jesus people wanting Jesus to do a sign or a miracle, it was often from a motivation of them coming from a selfish point of view, really. Prove yourself to us and we will believe that kind of thing. Uh, If we recall, we go into the time when Jesus was tempted in the desert. The devil tempted him to do certain things to prove that he was the son of God. Or turn these stones into bread if you're hungry, just feed yourself. And Jesus never did a miracle or never gave a sign that was according to the will of man. He always did it in accordance to the will of the divine father, which Jesus Christ being God in the flesh. He never did it just to satisfy the curiosity of people. When uh, Jesus was on the cross, even at that moment when he was At his last breath, the Pharisees said to him, So, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down off that cross and save yourself. And it says then, he saved others, but he can't even save himself. Now, even at that moment, they were demanding Christ to perform a sign. But Jesus, as I said, always did things that was in line with what the Father wanted, and that even Jesus dying on the cross was the complete divine plan. Uh, so you can understand why Jesus would say these words, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will never believe. Now there is, as I said, there is a strong mindset of that in the world today. Show me physical evidence, show me proof, and I will believe. One of the most important things about the Christian life is that there has to be there has to be a leap of faith and that we believe things that we do not see phys- physically even god himself we do not see physically we believe in his spirit and the presence of his d- divine presence all around the world we take a leap of faith in believing that and so if there was physical evidence for everything then it would destroy the very concept of faith. There has to be an element of faith and a step that we take in towards in believing in God. And um, it's sort of a discipline and a practice that God encourages us to get into. 
because um, there has to be a level of faith. The man's response is actually quite interesting. He doesn't get into a debate with Jesus. He doesn't sort of um, argue with him about this. All he says is the continuation of his plea, Sir, come down before my child dies. That's all he says. It could have been very easy to argue with Jesus, debate with Jesus, but he just continues with the begging and pleading. And I've heard some people say that the Greek word sir can also mean a sort of lord or lordship um, meaning behind that word. And then Jesus says to him, go, your son will live. So we see two two parts here into this man having faith. One is is that he has absolute confidence and trust that Jesus will do this. He just knows in his heart that Jesus is the one. And then when he says, go, your son will live, he also believes Jesus when he says that. He doesn't doubt him. He doesn't question him. He just simply believes when Jesus says, go, he returns to Capernaum. Then the story continues in verse 51. While he was still on the way, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. When he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him, Yesterday, at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. Then the father realised that that was the exact time at which, at which Jesus had said to him, Your son will live. And we see great results of that because it says, He and his whole household believe believed. So miracles and signs has always been intended to point people to the um, realization of Jesus as Lord, that he is the Messiah. Um, it's not all, It's not just to give physical proof, which is what people want nowadays, hard evidence, but it's almost as if Jesus does the miracle and then there's a part to play on their side to work this out and sort of figure out that he is the Lord, he is the Messiah. And as this man traces back the timing of when this happened, he knew that it was because of Jesus's divine power that his son uh, was healed. Now I want to bring up sort of two points really to uh, conclude and draw all this together. One is a very difficult question, but we would have to ask this with a, with a passage like this, and that is, how do we respond as Christians today when people beg God to do something? When they beg him to heal someone or just cry out to him, Lord, please heal my friend or my family member. And it doesn't happen in the way we wanted or expected. You know, How do we answer those questions? And it's very difficult because none of us knows the mind of God. I would say that a miracle is something that God does for us. But a miracle um, is something that can't, can't always be repeated under normal conditions. There has to be something supernatural about it that science can't always explain. And of course, if miracles did happen all the time, and we expected them, and then they wouldn't be miracles. It's almost as if God has a purpose in timing and a divine plan that we can't read his mind. Only God knows what his plan is. Uh, the other thing I would say is that um, there's different, defini different definitions of miracles. It's not always a supernatural event. Often a miracle can be in the timing of something. Um, uh, just to give a personal story, um, as we read in the text where this man sort of calculated back to when the miracle happened, he realized that it was at one o'clock in the afternoon when he was talking to Jesus. Um, I remember um, my wife is American, I'm from the UK, uh, we were living in Australia at the time, and we wanted to come. We felt called to come back to the UK to serve in ministry here, but obviously we had to get a, a visa for my wife. 
and uh, so we were living in Germany while waiting on this visa and the ministry company that we work for um, although visas can be difficult and a long process we've never had a problem with it really um, we just had to let it take its time and so we applied for this uh, visa we sort of put um, uh, the need out there if people wanted to do donate freely they were more than welcome to and uh, by God's grace the money the appropriate amount that we needed was given to us and so we said oh you know praise God thank you for answering that prayer and then we um, handed all the paperwork in to get the visa and then it was rejected and at that, at that exact time the government sort of uh, changed their process and they were they weren't happy with, with the way we were going about things and applying for visas and so they just changed the rules on us and we didn't know that we only found that out while in mid process and of course which meant all that money was lost and that visa was denied and so you can just imagine our response we were just really discouraged and worried so we came to the UK to visit for Christmas on a short short term basis and then knowing that we had to leave in a couple of days and uh, we were just knowing that we had to return to Germany, not knowing what was going to happen. We were just really clinging to God and asking him what is going to happen. And then the day my dad drove me or drove us to the airport, he, he handed us an envelope. And then uh, going back almost six years, so track, tracing back like this man did, uh, about six years ago, I had spoken at a men's meeting about talking about the ministry that I was going to join a traveling ministry and one gentleman there, and I didn't know this, he was putting money aside every week for six years that the time I was serving God in other nations. And um, he must have heard that we were coming back and uh, the very day we were leaving, he gave my dad the envelope, my dad gave it to me and inside was the exact amount of money needed to apply for this new visa under these new guidelines and it was just like we saw the hand of God at work in these moments and so the miracle there for me was the timing of everything and um, just it wasn't a supernatural event but how God orchestrated everything to fall into place at the right time so I would also say that uh, to someone who may ask those deep questions, know that God has the bigger picture in mind. He knows the future. We don't. We can just live by faith and trust him in the present. But also, I would say another miracle is the fact that God is with us all the time and that Christ has removed our sins if we trust him. And that also is a miracle, the fact that he will comfort us in times of trial. So in a world that demands signs, uh, very much as Jesus said, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will never believe. Uh, we have to speak into that as Christians, and by God's grace and by his word, he will equip us and enable us to do that. And we see in the story that this man's son lived, and Jesus had so much compassion. I just wonder, did Jesus see the level of faith and trust in this man and he didn't sort of debate with him or argue with him he just continued in the pleading and the begging and Jesus obviously knew or that this man knew that Jesus could do it and so um, I hope this has blessed you today it's a wonderful story and uh, quite a short story in the gospel but it can speak volumes in today's world and so I think I would just like to end with prayer and especially pray for those who know of people who are suffering at the moment. Uh, so shall we pray to end this time? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and that you do indeed still do miracles today and that there are different kinds of miracles. And Lord, we thank you that you are with people in troubling times. We ask that you would please heal and comfort people, especially with those who are suffering with coronavirus at this time. We ask for your grace and goodness to pour upon us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, everyone. Thank you so much. God bless.